even our small group of people gather together to worship God. In Psalm 19, um, the psalmist tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. We come into the realm of the I am to worship. Let us seek the wisdom of God, whose spirit fills our being. Let us open the scriptures that the living word may be revealed to us. May our songs and prayers express our love this day. Let us worship together. Holy God, we come to you because you have first come to us. We worship you because you have first cherished and nurtured us. Holy God, we know that we are frail and weak creatures, but not as frail as we sometimes pretend. Please unmask our pretenses. Most patient God, we know we are foolish creatures, but not as foolish as our irresponsibility would often suggest. Please for expose our excuses. Loving God, we know we are sinful creatures, but not as hopeless as we act in times of self-pity. Please deliver us from our self-deceit. Most loyal God, merciful judge, confront us with the truth about ourselves. Help us to accept responsibility for our many failures. Where deep within we need forgiveness and healing, come with your Spirit and renew the fabric of our souls. 
where we need a greater faith in ourselves, come with your Spirit and restore our confidence as your children. Where we need stronger faith in you, come with your Spirit to consolidate the faith we do have. We ask this prayer in the name of Jesus, your Son, who loved us and gave Himself for us. Amen. Following God's law is sweeter than honey and far more precious than jewels. Wisdom revives the soul and makes us whole. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. I do commend to you the weekly bulletin. There is quite a bit of information about the countdown to the special weekend activities that are coming up. And we hope that you will come along, participate, and enjoy um, some of these events. If you haven't booked in for the dinner, that's probably too late to do that, but you can certainly come along on Saturday morning and see the exhibition. And even though you're familiar with the building, at least the Warriors Chapel, you can join the tour and find out a little bit more information. And then the big service on Sunday morning at 9.30, and then the evening one at 5, and the one that I want to just um, highlight is our service next Wednesday. Now, it kind of is getting lost in the, all the other details of the forthcoming weekend, but next Wednesday's lunchtime service will also be there as part of our celebrations. So, I hope you'll come along next Wednesday, and we'll be continuing maybe bringing to an end our 90th anniversary celebration. So spread the word, bring a few other folk along. Uh, we'll maybe introduce one or two other features. I'm giving that some thought at the moment, uh, but we'll be picking the theme of remembering our building and giving thanks for it and celebrating the fact that we have been here for 90 years. So see you next Wednesday, if not before. Thank you. Today's reading is from the prophecy of Jeremiah at chapter 23, reading verses 25 to 32. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbour, as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. The prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who has my word... Let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbour. Behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, he says, Behold, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them, therefore they shall not profit this people at all, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As most of you know, I grew up on a farm in Northern Ireland. I can vividly remember the old thrashing mill which we used during the harvest season. Even thinking about it makes me feel old. And of course, the threshing mill isn't used anymore. It's now consigned to an agricultural museum. I've actually seen them in such places. Now, the threshing mill was an interesting piece of machinery. It was used essentially to separate the corn, in our case, from the chaff. The threshing mill would be brought into the field, maybe around about the middle somewhere, and all the, the sheaves of corn uh, would be brought to the threshing mill and without going through the details of the process, which involved quite a number of people, the chaff was separated from the corn. When it was all over and the threshing mill was removed from the field, there was this heap of chaff left. And the local farmer who owned the field uh, lit a fire and all the chaff was burnt leaving behind a large black mark. So when you saw that black mark, you knew that the threshing had been completed. Jeremiah, the prophet, uses this metaphor to ask a question. We read in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 28 towards the end of the verse, what is the chaff to the wheat? In the Living Bible paraphrase, the text actually becomes a statement. There is a difference between chaff and wheat. From my first-hand experience during the threshing season, I certainly knew that this is the case. There is a vast difference between the chaff and the wheat. Chaff is the husk of the grain. It is so worthless, it is fit only to be burned. That's what the farmer does, as I've just explained. Chaff is lightweight and lacks substance. It contains no nourishment value of any kind. Chaff is deceptive. At a superficial glance, it bears a resemblance to the wheat. It has the appearance, at least from a distance, of pure grain. It offers the promise of sustenance but it only flatters to deceive. Wheat or corn, as it was in our case, by way of contrast, is the real thing. It is substantial. It has weight and solidity. It contains potential for germination and, of course, productivity. It can be made into bread to provide nourishment and sustenance. The vital difference between chaff and wheat is between the empty husk and the real content of the grain. There is a difference between the chaff and the wheat. Let me apply this little text from Jeremiah in two ways. Firstly, the contrast between chaff and wheat illustrates the state 
of the Christian church today. There is a huge amount of chaff lying around and very little wheat. So much that is said and done in church life is lightweight, superficial, deceptive, unsatisfying, and unproductive. Sadly, many churches have departed from the confessional basis on which they were established. They have embraced a modernism that has diluted the gospel, undermined the authority of scriptural teaching, and denied the relevance of Christian values. Much teaching in churches lacks doctrinal content and spiritual substance. Many sermons are eloquent topical homilies or polished essays devoid of biblical content and a gospel challenge. Christian issues are addressed in a superficial manner. Rarely do we catch a glimpse of what someone has called the majesty of divine truth. Too often the affirmations about God are replaced with the fanciful ideas of modern liberal theologians. All this is very deceptive. It has the appearance of wheat, of being the real thing. It has the promise of sustenance, but it lacks substance and reality. There is a difference between chaff and wheat. Secondly, the contrast between chaff and wheat illustrates the mass of religion in Australia today, which includes all kinds of beliefs and practices. People believe in a vague notion of God. Time and time again, people say to me, I believe in God, but what does that actually mean? Sometimes people say, I believe in a God, so that could be basically anything. But their belief lacks substance and reality. Much of what masquerades as religion does not affirm the uniqueness of Christ or state the sinful condition of human nature. Certain brands of Christian teaching admit that Jesus was a very good man. He did good deeds. He had good ethics. He loved people, and he had a social concern for his society. But such teaching represents the death of Christ as being mainly a revelation of God's compassion, a moving exhibition of God's wounded love without any redemptive significance. And that's the problem. Once you take away the redemptive significance from our preaching and teaching, the reality is there is no gospel left. Christ is alive from the dead only in the sense that his spiritual influence is still around as a powerful dynamic working in the lives of men and women. But that's as far as it goes. 
As regards the way of salvation, all that is required of people is that they should believe in God, that they should adopt the ideals of Christ's conduct and walk with Him as their leader and companion through life. Many preachers and teachers still use the ancient language of evangelical Christianity. But the vital content of what it means is denied. In contrast to this chaff is the teaching of God's Word in what we call the Holy Bible. It is compared to wheat. It is like wheat because it has substance and nourishment. This is the living Word of God. And when we feast upon it and saturate ourselves in its truth, then we will be spiritually nourished. Whatever its theme, God's Word in the Scriptures is God-breathed and is designed for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. It bears the stamp of truth. Unlike the chaff which is tossed about by every wind that blows, it survives with unchanging steadfastness with a seal of eternal approval upon it. Now, even though people have tried to deny the truth of the Bible, even though they have tried to discard the Bible for all kinds of reasons, the reality is the Bible is still the most popular book in the world today. It's the world's greatest seller. And the reason for that is because it is the wheat, not the chaff, which blows away and is gone. Because of this, the Bible provides sustenance for the souls of men and women. So if you as a Christian person want to be fed, if you want to grow as a Christian and become mature in your faith, then read and study the Bible. It is the wheat, not the chaff. Alexander Stewart wrote these words concerning the Bible. It is the wheat of God which nourishes and satisfies our spiritual nature. It meets the needs of our understanding because it is a word of truth. The demands of our conscience because it is a word of life. And the hunger of our heart because it is a word of love. What is the chaff to the wheat? Or as the Living Bible puts it, there is a difference between the chaff and the wheat. Well might we reiterate the prophet Jeremiah's exclamation. When you compare chaff and wheat, they are like chalk and cheese. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, we remember in our prayers today all those who have faithfully served in this church over the past 90 years. We give thanks for their faithful witness and for the rich spiritual legacy they have left behind. We thank you for what this church means to so many in this community. Even those who rarely, if ever, enter through our door. Even as they drive past or as they walk past, this building has an impact upon them. This location here where our church is positioned makes an impact upon people's lives. Even the church spire reminds them of a sacred space. And we are glad for all those who have benefited from coming into that space over many years, even in recent times. We know that many people see this church as a, a place of solace in a world of confusion and bewilderment and noise and clamor. So we thank you for the distinguished history of this place, not just for the building, but above all for the people who have been part of this Christian community over all these decades. And tonight we pray, Lord, that you will be with us this coming weekend as we celebrate our 90th anniversary for those who will gather for the dinner on Friday evening at the Yacht Club, may that be a very enjoyable occasion. We ask that you will be with our guest speaker, Dr. Paul Logan, that he will bring a message that will be timely and encouraging to us, and that the whole evening will be a wonderful experience for the uh, many people who will share in it. And then we pray for our special services our service on Sunday morning, which no doubt will be our largest attendance. We pray there will be a real sense of your presence in this building and be with all those who will be traveling to the service and those who will be coming from a distance, many visitors and former members and others, representatives of various groups in our local community here in the ACT. We pray there will be a real sense of your presence in that service and that as your word goes forth, it will indeed do so in a powerful way and impact the lives of so many who will be attending. We also pray for the ongoing uh, anniversary celebrations with the Church at Five service and for those who will be giving their own personal testimonies of what this church has meant to them over the years. And then for our service next Wednesday as we bring our celebrations to a conclusion. We pray that too, although much smaller in scale, will also be very special to those who will share in that service. And at this time as we celebrate our 90th anniversary, we remember those who would love to have been with us this weekend to share in these celebrations, but Humanly speaking, it's sad that they will not be with us because they've gone to be with you. And we remember today the families of David White, our former session clerk, and also of Ross Ramsey, who was a regular attender here for many years and indeed in more recent times, a regular attender at our lunchtime services. So we do pray for the families of both these fine stalwarts of our church, that you will comfort them 
in their time of sadness. So, Lord, we give thanks in conclusion then for all who have served over the years and have gone to be with you. May we live in hope that one day we will be reunited in your presence. So we ask these prayers in your name, in the name of the one who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. But his mercy waneth ever, God is wisdom, God is love. Faith with the fair came twined, and comfort from above. Everywhere his glory shineth, God is wisdom, God is love. Go from this time of worship, pardoned and forgiven, and committed to using the Word of God in our lives as an opportunity to be nourished and sustained. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Mm -hmm.